Welcome to the Integrated Schools Podcast. I'm Andrew, a white dad from Denver. And I'm Dr. Val, a black mom from North Carolina. Dr. Val! That's it! It's official. It's official. Congratulations. I'm not at all surprised that you did it and very proud and excited for you. I appreciate you. And you know, I was thinking back to when you asked me to join the podcast, I was like, look, I have this dissertation to write. I don't know how much time I have for you. (laughs) You're like, it's all good, Val. We'll make it work. Um, It's just going to be a little bit. Lies. How about just a little more? I would just a tiny bit more. Maybe just a little more time. Maybe just a little more. (laughs) It all worked out. And this has been a joy. And I appreciate you. And thank you for having me. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, congratulations. It's uh, it's well earned and I will gladly call you Dr. Brown from now on. Oh, you only have to do it on Tuesdays. <laughs> okay. Only on Tuesdays. <laughs> All right. That's, that's fair. Well, this episode um, is not about how you became a doctor, but it is it is the debrief Carol Anderson on White Rage. Yes. And we're just going to take a whole episode to to kind of unpack what we heard last time because that was a monster. <laughs> yeah, I think it's fair to unpack it. Yeah, there was so much in there. I think at the end of nearly an hour long episode, I feel like we would have uh, been abusing people to try to reflect on all that we learned right in that moment. So yeah. take a little pause and come back. And now we'll sort of stretch out a little bit and talk about what we heard. So if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it and then come back and process with us. Yes. So where where should we start? We talked to her a couple of weeks ago now. What's been sitting with you from the conversation? What are kind of the big takeaways you had? Yeah, after the conversation, we had the State of the Union address. Mm-hmm. And we also had the response to the State of the Union address. Mm-hmm. And all I could hear in that response were many of the dog whistles that Carol had mentioned. And I think it it feels haunting in some ways to to know these things exist and then to see them happen and then to not be able to stop it, right? Like, as you know, from reading the book and talking to Carol about it, it's impossible not to see the patterns. And it's happening again, if we think about the confirmation hearings for who could be the first Black woman Supreme Court justice, right. Justice Brown Jackson. So- I don't know. It's wild. It's wild. And I don't know how to stop this train. Yeah. The, how do we like t- make the train stop going on this same loop over and mm-hmm. over again? There's some ways I think prior to reading White Rage, prior to that conversation with with Dr. Anderson, felt like everything is unprecedented. This is all so new and so crazy. And like, how did we get here? And on the one hand, the clarity that, you know, she says like the making the illegible legible that she is yeah. gifted at. It's like, oh, OK, there's some like kind of sense of relief of like, OK. We're not just dropped in the middle of some totally unknown land where this has never happened before. We're not. We're still here. So, you know, maybe there's some comfort to be taken from that. But then it's also like, well, why do we have to keep doing this? Why can't we learn? You know, the the like, if we don't know our history, we're doomed to repeat it. I, I think I, I'm feeling the realness of that more now than I have in the past. I agree. We're living that. We are repeating the past. I absolutely. Yeah, because I think in school, it just feels kind of like fake. Like, okay, right. I, how can I repeat the past? I have electricity. But but these patterns that we are seeing now are definitely are repeating themselves. One of my good friends, Rebecca, she mentioned when they were sitting at the table and she's a, a white Jewish woman. And she was like, you know, maybe it's just our turn to repeat the cycle of fighting and going and moving, mm. you know, and trying to push the needle. And when she first said that, I was like, that don't, no, that seems really unfair. Right. I don't <laughs> want to turn. I'm, no. I'm, I pass. I skip. No, yeah. this should not be like, you know, some, some wheel that we just keep spinning on. But I'm thinking about those words now. Our version looks a little more modern, but it's still the same work as right. abolitionists, civil rights Mm -hmm. fighters, like it's still the same work, right? And after listening to Dr. Anderson and knowing the next generations will have to continue this work. And it's not new, again, to have interracial coalitions. And this will, this work will continue. Yeah, I'm thinking of your question to her about like, can this ever work? Maybe let's hear the clip. Can we ever successfully use legislation to have justice? Or is it going to always be a fight like this because white rage and white supremacy is so crafty 
we can use legislation Mm -hmm. and it will always be a fight. So it's the answer to your question is yes. Yes. Uh, The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Mm. I mean, that's it, right? We do all we can because it does actually meaningfully improve things. And we always have to keep fighting and, and always have to be vigilant. How do you feel about that? Because I will say after January 6th, I just felt exhausted by all of the things, right? We made it safely through the inauguration. That was nerve wracking. Like, are we we going to make it to this? And I think I took some time then to like disconnect from news sources Mm -hmm. in the same way, because definitely in 2016, every day in 2017, I am like ingesting the news cycle. Mainlining. You know, Mm -hmm. and it was intense trying to stay alert because I felt like if I took any time away, it was all going to come crashing down. And I am still aware now, but it's hard to um, conjure up the same amount of energy that I had to Mm. engage in that same way. And so I worry about, in some ways, my own vigilance. Yeah, because on the one hand, it feels like, we need all the vigilance, right? Like right. every moment there is something going wrong. Like get those eyelids propped open. Right. <laughs> but but what degree of vigilance is possible and sustainable? Because we can't give the amount of vigilance that's required all the time or, or we'll burn out. Do you think some of us are just taking on the... Um, the burden of that vigilance more than others? And so that's why it feels so burdensome versus if more people were... Mm. Engaged. If we were like collectively sharing the burden. Yeah. I think there's there's certainly something to that. I can admit at times of being completely clueless, right? Like, I don't yeah. know what's going on, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, that is much more likely now since the last inauguration mm. than it was in the four years prior to that, right? Mm. Yeah. This like need for vigilance and and kind of who is sharing in that. And I don't know. Some, you know, some piece of that feels like who holds out hope that their vigilance is mm. is worth anything. Mm-hmm. You know, I think a mm-hmm. lot of people are like, yeah, I don't, I don't care. Cause like, what does mm. my caring do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Too many times I have cared. I've been told that this is the thing, you know, now if I just do this, now if I just do that and like my life stays the same. So mm-hmm. why am I going to spend my energy being vigilant on that? Yeah. Do you think that is for marginalized folks, white folks, who are you, like, who are those people? I mean, yeah, yeah. in my mind, when I'm saying that, I'm thinking of marginalized folks. Yeah, right. Because I'm thinking, like, specifically of, like, voter disenfranchisement, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I've tried everything I can. You know, so it's not like I don't want to vote. It's because there's so many barriers against right. me. And does my vote even matter when, right. you know, my district is drawn so it's so tiny or, you know. Right. Or, like, I do vote and the person who I voted for gets elected and my life doesn't change in any meaningful right. way. Right. So like, what does, and that, you know, nobody yeah. comes to my neighborhood until four years later when they're trying to get me to vote again. Right. But I think there's probably a, a corollary amongst more privileged, certainly amongst white folks of similarly, my vote doesn't matter because like, basically America takes care of me anyway. Right. And I remember like crying out into the social media void, like it matters who you vote for. Like it absolutely, right. to me, to my existence. Yeah. So while it might yeah. not impact your existence or you're only thinking about it from, you know, one issue area, like I need you to look at this collectively. You'll be okay with the tax increase as long as I have the right to vote. Like, come on right. now, y'all. Let's, right. let's, let's think about this a little more broadly. Yeah. It's interesting because Dr. Anderson's first book, at least, kind of starts off at this kind of idea of, What do we all need? And let's maybe take a listen to what she said about that. My first book was called Eyes Off the Prize, Mm -hmm. The United Nations and the African-American Struggle for Human Rights. It was looking at how African-Americans in the 1940s envisioned that it was going to take a human rights agenda Mm -hmm. in order to deal with the human rights violations that the Black community had faced for centuries, that civil rights, although important, weren't enough. You had to have human rights. So in addition to the right to vote, in addition to the right to a speedy and fair trial, in addition to the right not to be illegally searched and seized, you also needed the right to education. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. You also needed the right to health care. You also needed the right to employment. You also needed the right to housing. You needed this human rights platform in order to deal with the human rights va- violations that had just decimated the Black community. And it was the power of McCarthyism, the Second Red Scare, and the Cold War that defined those human rights as communistic, as socialistic, and that allowed the right wing in American politics to say those who are advocating for the right to health care, those who are advocating for the right to education, they're communist, they're Soviet stooges. And so it pushed the Black leadership, the Black community, off of that human rights platform Mm. and onto a civil rights platform, trying Mm -hmm. to handle all of these issues via civil rights. So am I allowed to be in my feelings a little bit? Yeah. I'm in my feelings about how both true and ridiculous it is that Black people in America have had to lobby for human rights. It sounds ridiculous being from the land that prides itself on freedom and justice and democracy. And yet it's it's true, right? We're talking about basic, the right to an education, the right to have a school that I can attend versus let's just shut the whole district down and nobody gets school and you're on your own, right? What were you thinking when you heard her talk about that? So what jumped to my mind actually was, was, drawing back to the care framework, actually, and this like idea of affirming the dignity of all people, that first principle, right? The push for human rights was saying we need to affirm the dignity of all people, that all people are worthy of these things that we consider to be human rights, like health care, like a job, like a place to live. And I don't know, I, I'm struck by the difficult decision that those civil rights leaders had to make in that moment mm-hmm. of saying, if we keep pushing for human rights, we are going to get lumped in with the communists and we're never going to get anywhere. Oh my God. And so instead we're going to like scale back our vision mm. of what we're demanding to, to civil rights, which are important and, and we, and are necessary, but we're not going to fight this battle. And I can't imagine what that mm. choice is like to give up on the humanity piece because you recognize that it's a losing battle, mm. but maybe there is hope in the civil rights piece. I don't know. Right. The hope that we can use the country's laws to apply to us because our basic humanity is denied so significantly. Right. There's absolutely no question that these Black leaders recognize their own humanity. Right. It was the fight to get other people to recognize it. And I think that also takes a toll on you. Mm. So when we think about racially isolated schools. And I went to several. (laughs) I had no problem knowing I was a human. I had no problem knowing I was valuable. I had no problem having a good time, having friends, being loved. You know, there was humanity all in the place. And yet to still feel the need to fight for that recognition from others. I think I'm just left with feeling like how unfair that is. And I can understand, I can empathize with people who you're like, you know what, I'm not going to fight to prove my humanity to you because I already Mm. know that. So I'm going to tap out of this game. Please leave me alone. Yeah. So then I think about this, you know, this idea and Dr. Anderson says here, uh, I want to play this clip. And the, the thing was NAACP back off of this case, get rid of this case and you too can have high schools for black children. And the NAACP called them gilded cages of segregation. Mm. And said, no, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that. It was like white supremacy saw that first opportunity. If you're willing to give up human rights and just settle for civil rights, maybe you're Mm -hmm. willing to give up separate if we actually give you equal. Right. And the NAACP saying, like, we're we're not going to do that again. We're not going to give up on our vision. We do see in present day people who, like, say are for abolition and some who mm-hmm. are for reform, right? So mm-hmm. I'm sure there are folks in both camps who are like, you're going too far, you're not going far enough. And I think folks who are like, let's reform, they are pulled by folks who are, let's abolish in a positive way. I think folks who get reform enable folks who want abolition to like keep pushing. Yeah. And that's probably always been, there's always been people yeah. sort of across that spectrum and yep. and probably a need for both. 
Yeah. Because, right, on the one hand, you look around and I think you just like, we're not going to get there without burning the whole thing down. Right. You're not going to reform it. You just need to start from scratch. Right. And, and <laughs> kids are still in the school. Kids are still right. in the school. What exactly. we gonna do? What we gonna do? What we gonna do? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And if that's a yeah, yeah, if that's a twenty year process, what happens in the meantime? Right. Because we've seen from history, we close the school, and there is no option for black kids. There is suffering, and the white folks who are well resourced, they keep moving on. Either through their own resources or through government resources, right? I mean, like this right. idea that like we're gonna close all the schools and white kids hear vouchers to go to private schools. Right. Right. You don't even have right. to spend your own money, your right. own ill gotten family wealth. Right. You don't even have to dip into that. No, no. Here's the state money saying, Yeah, go to these private segregation academies. Yep. And then even if you do have schools, you're gonna have vastly different funding, like this clip here from Dr. Anderson. And so you had these dual school systems where you had funding for white children's education that was like exponentially higher than the funding for black children. You had where there were no black high schools sometimes. And so that the schooling for black children would end like at the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Um, By the time we were in the 1940s, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and South Carolina all had more than 50% of their adult Black population having fewer than six years of Mm. Jim Crow education. Here we are back in the 40s, and you have this like exponentially higher funding for white kids' schools than for Black kids' schools. And, you know, then we have 80 years of quote unquote progress. And then just two years ago or something, Ed Build put out their report showing that schools with predominantly black students have $23 billion less per year mm. than schools with predominantly white students. Hmm. How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel reading that or knowing that? It's, um, it, it makes me, un- it makes me uncomfortable and it makes me try to reach for I, I, I like try to find some silver lining <laughs> because I'm like, oh, God, that's really bad. Maybe it's not as bad as I think it is. Oh. You know, like those were like all black and all white schools in the 40s. And now it's schools that predominantly serve black and brown kids versus predominantly oh. white kids. And so, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't know that it really like helps that much. I do think it, it does sort of tie to this idea that, that Dr. Anderson talks about of white people who are collateral damage. Yeah. Um, you know, because those schools with $23 billion less in funding have white kids in them. Yeah. Not a lot, but there are white kids in them. And those are those sort of, you know, the collateral damage of this replication yeah. of the same structures just without the explicit racism. So shortly after recording the episode with Dr. Anderson, I saw a story about how many of these anti-CRT bills that are going through legislation would they would cause schools to lose their advanced placement distinctions Mm -hmm. because they couldn't do the work required for the AP exam. And that made me think about this collateral damage, right? So, hey, Mm. you think you're just hurting me when now your school won't be that high prestige school because it's also hurting you. Right. <laughs> that is that is part of the, the impact of white rage. Like you're trying to hurt me, but you're not just hurting me. So we have so much energy spent withholding money from, you know, half the population. Yeah. And for what? Right. So I don't see the silver lining. No, yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not really a silver lining. I mean, that's why it's white rage. It's not white anger or like white displeasure. Right. You know, rage is wild. Rage is out of control. Rage ends up hurting everybody. Everybody. Yeah, there's all these ways that we're that we're hurting ourselves. And it seems like the only time that we make progress, and I mean, maybe this is like sort of Derek Bell and interest convergence here, but like mm-hmm. the only time we make progress is when it seems to be in kind of the white power structure's interest for there to be progress. And this this clip here from Dr. Anderson really gets at that. You also have the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And the Cold War is where the U.S. is doing its strut on the international stages. We are the leader of the free world. We are against those really bad communists over there, that Soviet Union um, that denies their people their freedom. Then when you're reading through Pravda and Izvestia, 
which are the the government communication organs for for the Soviet Union, they harp on every lynching. Mm. They harp on every black diplomat who comes to the U.S. and is hit with Jim Crow, where they can't get a hotel room, Mm -hmm. where they're thrown out of a restaurant, they're thrown out of a theater because they weren't sitting in the colored section, right? Mm -hmm. And and, and, And the Soviets are like, mm, So this is the democracy that they're trying to give to Mm. you. This is what they're bringing. This is why Chief Justice Earl Warren was lobbying so hard to make it a 9-0 decision Mm. because it was so important for U.S. foreign policy that this be a unanimous decision. So it still wasn't about the rights of the citizens who built the country, (laughs) you know, with blood, sweat, and tears. It was about, hey, we don't want to look bad. To the Russians. Right, on the international stage. And I think the fear of folks who are trying to ban an accurate teaching of history is for these realities to come up, right? Like, how do Mm -hmm. you justify these actions? How do you deal with the anger that might come from learning about these things? I think... As challenging as it is to learn these things, what it gives us, you and I, the opportunity to do is to process what happened so that we can do better and that we can be better. I think that is a healthy way to start reconciliation. I think it's necessary. And to learn that we are doing this for our international reputation and not because we value the people of this country and their contributions. That hurts. It's painful. I don't even know what to say about it other than shame on you, not you. Shame on them. Right. And I I, I think it's fair for the listeners to know that I'm just at a loss for words sometimes with this. This is when you throw yeah. the book. This is when you're like, right. I don't know. This right. is when you're like, I'm just frustrated. Yeah. These are real feelings that it is hard to grapple with. If we are in a place where we actually do start educating all our kids, I feel like that's the kind of vision. That's this thing that Dr. Anderson holds out that keeps her going, right? This imagination, this like, yeah. well, imagine what we could be. And, and I think we should play this clip here of her talking about that. Imagine what this nation could be if we educated all of our children. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Imagine what this nation could be if the Billions that we funnel into a carceral state were actually deployed to support families and communities Mm -hmm. so that they could fly. Imagine what we could be if we had elected representatives who were actually representative of the populations, right? And so what they were responding to was climate change. Mm -hmm. What they were responding to was a vastly unequal criminal justice system. What they were responding to was the the need for for real safety and real security in this nation. So our babies wouldn't have to have shooter drills in their schools. Imagine, because if you can't imagine it, you can't even fight for it. Mm. I think about how the enslaved had to imagine freedom (sighs) when there was nothing around them that told them they could be free. How they imagined what being able to hold on to their babies looked like, having their families together and not being sold on the auction block. They had to imagine that when around them, there was so much that told them, oh, that's not what you do. That's not who you are. The power of that imagining led to incredible resistance. It feels like, if you think back to the idea of the enslaved imagining freedom, mm-hmm. that, that we have made progress, mm. that that is not still where we are. Mm-hmm. You know, so maybe the, the hamster wheel is like slowly moving mm. in some sort of positive direction. But I don't know, maybe that doesn't, does that feel real to you? I'm thinking back to your answer about the silver lining thing. And no, we're not like in the same place, but are we free? 
Mm-hmm. But imagining I could not do this work with you and my full time job without being able to imagine it being better. Like I just, right. I couldn't. And that vision of it being better for us having these interracial coalitions and schools, all of that feels like right in my heart of hearts and possible. Yeah. And I think people are willing. And so yeah. what's hard to imagine is why people don't want to get on board. Right. Yeah. Why we aren't there yet. Yeah, yeah. That's what's hard to imagine. And I think that type of hope is necessary for all of us, you know, as honest and painful the words coming from Dr. Anderson are, she exudes a hope that it doesn't feel like it's possible knowing all she knows. <laughs> right? right, right. Like, how are you still smiling? If she can still be hopeful, if she can <laughs> still have joy, then yeah. yeah. Right? And the, the joy part, are you going to share that with the good people? Black joy is just such a powerful tool of resistance. Hmm. For Dr. Anderson to know all that she knows, um, to remain hopeful, and to be able to connect to joy, I think is an excellent model for all of us doing this work. And I didn't realize I was using anger so much as a tool to do Mm. some of my activism work or like an energy source for my... Mm -hmm. um, activism work until very recently. And that just got heavy. And, you know, I wasn't angry at folks that I was building with or, you know, people who were trying to learn. It was just, I was just angry at the situation. Like, why are we even here? Right. Right? And I think that is depleting. And what I am shifting to is finding joy in these spaces and in spaces like this one with my friend, Andrew, Mm -hmm. where we can, although we're talking about really difficult things, I think we are working through. I think we're we're trying to heal. We're trying to reconcile. We're yeah. trying to find a path. And there's a little clearing here and a little clearing there and, you know, things right. we can celebrate. And I think that's also important. And we are making progress, even though it feels slow and we might be spinning our wheels. And people need to know that, <laughs> that something they're doing is working, that there's some joy right. somewhere because we are not recruiting a whole bunch of people to this effort if we're mad all the time. Do you want right. to hang around people who are mad all the time? <laughs> no, I don't. No, right, yeah. No, yeah, I think that, I mean, it's a, it's a great point. And I think anger is powerful. It burns fast and, mm-hmm. and bright. And it's hard not to get angry. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, like you threw the wonderful Dr. Anderson's book across the room. I twice. did, so, I did, like, I did. It's legit to get angry. And... If if we only ever live in the anger, then it's it's really hard to to continue this. And I feel like she just embodies this so well. The joy it was a joyful conversation. Right? It was funny. I mean, you know, this clip here. It's like Ernest Angley laying on hands. You are healed. <laughs> <laughs> you are healed. Yes. Like, come on, that's amazing. That I mean, is, hilarious. Like, hilarious. Hilarious. And and so, yeah, so we have to we have to hold on to that. And I do think yeah. that holding out that vision of what we want to be mm-hmm. and recognizing that we have made progress. We have not made as much progress as we could have, as we should have, mm-hmm. as we must. Mm-hmm. And we're digging out from a real deep pit. I mean, that's the other thing I take away from yeah. all the things that she shared is just like how deep the hole is yeah. that we're trying to dig out of. And we got to keep digging. We've got to like hold out vision for <sighs> what the... What it looks like when we get up there to keep us going, but but we also have to find some joy in the digging, I think. What just made me like, you know, catch my breath is imagining a hole, a 400 year dug hole of enslavement yeah. and indigenous removal. Like, that's a deep hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a deep hole. And there's still some people down at the bottom digging. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, we got to fill this in. And they're like, no, no, we got to keep digging. We got to keep digging. Right. It's like, right. Yeah. But I got you to get a Black Lives Matter sign for your house. How's that going? That's right. That's right. It's here. It arrived. Okay, good. It arrived. Good. It, I thought it was coming with a stand to hold it up. So I got to, <laughs> it did not. I got to, I got to order that too. But, but it's here. Okay. It's sitting on my dining room table. It's about to go up. Okay, awesome. And now uh, we, we promised listeners we would check in on your hobby. Oh, um, because, no. Because you're supposed to be starting a hobby. Okay. Now you are Dr. Dr. Val. What's, what's the hobby going to be? Okay, so um, right now it's... Nintendo Switch. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) 
That's exactly it right that now. Counts. That's that counts. That's exactly it right now. Yep. Um, Some people build model trains. That's right. That's right. We all have <laughs> our things. I'm a gamer. Switch. I'm now a gamer. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, yep. Check back for an update, folks. I am going to yep. pull it together. I promise. Well, congratulations. Thank you so much. On being a doctor. And yeah, thanks for, for finding some joy in all of this with me. It's always a pleasure to be in this with you. So try to know better and do better. Until next time, everyone. I was yep. just making that up. Never yep. mind. <laughs> All those words sounded good. They did. They did. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. Total lies. Yeah.